Hello there, welcome back to the Agassino Zynga show with I, your host Agassino Zynga and this is episode number 714, 714 of the Agassino Zynga show with I, your host Agassino Zynga and I hope you are doing well wherever this podcast may find you, I hope you are doing swimmingly. If you're listening to me via the podcast and you notice some difference in my voice via your headphones, especially if you're not viewing the podcast, you're listening to it via the audio platforms on Apple and Spotify and all the other places you listen to, and you're wondering why are there little pops at the end of some of my words that I'm pronouncing? It's because I don't have my pop shield. I had to get rid of it because it looked kind of gunky. I'm not going to lie. My pop shield looked like some smokers when they don't scrape their tongues. That's kind of how it looked like. I know it's nasty. I know if you're eating, you're going to be grossed out. I know, forgive me. But that's how it basically looked. So I had to take it off because it was starting to touch my lips and I felt some you know, some moisture on my lips that wasn't there previously. And I, and I nearly made myself bath over the microphone, which would have been a far worse uh, situation. So instead of not, I didn't want to worsen the situation. So I removed the pop shield, took it off and ordered a new one on Amazon. Guess how much these little foam pop shields cost? I'll tell you, 20 pounds. <laughs> Obviously I could buy a generic one, but I wanted to buy a proper one that was made by the manufacturer who makes my car- my uh, microphone, which is a Rode pod mic. So I got one from Rode and they cost 20 pounds. 20 pounds. Isn't that a B-I-T-C-H? But hey, it's the cost of living. It's the cost of existing. It is what it is. So I've been thinking about a lot of things I wanted to touch upon today, some of which were topics I should have touched upon on the previous episode, but I forgot because I was in a rush and because I'm a busy, busy, busy boy. So the first thing I was thinking about was Scott McTominay and his double against Brentford the other day. Yes, I know I spoke about it in a previous episode. I understand. But I'm just thinking about Scott McTominay and the fact that, you know, his fortunes are looking much brighter now. He's obviously been able to prove that he's definitely a useful player in our squad and could definitely have some utility, especially coming off the bench and bloody blah, 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 blah. But what the Scott McTominay story tells me at Man United is two things. One, I, for one, really took it for granted when my GOAT, my greatest player of all time, David Beckham, was playing for United. That era of United when, you know, we were winning everything, we were competing everywhere, we had amazing players, we had amazing moments, um, was really a special time. And I think ever since the Glazers took over, they've, of course, killed our club little by little. It's been death by a thousand cuts. We've sort of slowly but surely seen our once great team crumble to the point where now uh, Scott McTominay is one of our more important players in our squad. I think in yesterday's years, Scott McTominay would have got nowhere near the first team. That kind of shows the kind of level and standards we've been. But I also think Scott McTominay has been kind of unlucky at the club. And I'm one of his fiercest critics. When, when McFred, which was Fred and McTominay, were playing in our midfield, I fucking hated it. I think most people will agree now that Fred is definitely the better player out of the two. But if you want someone to score you goals, McTominay definitely is the one. But McTominay suffered the same curse that Paul Pogba suffered from. Because Paul Pogba is like six foot four, you know, looks the way that he looks, people automatically thought he was a defensive midfielder. But he's not. He's more of a number 10 than he is a number six. He might be a Pirlo type quarterback player where he wants to play deep and he wants to spray balls left and right but he's not a combative defensive midfielder he's not Makalele but because of his height and his you know and his stature and stuff people thought he would be like Patrick Vieira type player which he definitely wasn't and I think the same thing happened to Scott McTominay I think the story goes Scott McTominay in the youth system at United was playing up front as a striker then he got put into midfield but he's always had goal scoring instincts and obviously he can strike a ball really well. He's got decent heading ability and whatnot. Obviously he's built like a tank, so obviously he can you know handle himself in the area and against some big defenders. But I think at United, because we suffered for so long in our midfield, for some reason, I don't know why, midfield for us has always been a little bit of a blind spot over the years. Even when Alex Ferguson was in charge, we never really sorted out the centre midfield position. We sometimes played gigs there. We played skulls there until his last legs. Like It's very strange why the centre midfield position in Man United has always been a bit of an overlooked position. But I think because of that, there was always a necessary need to have somebody there. And Scott being Scott, he filled that need. He never complained and he played. But I think because he played in a position that he's not good at in centre midfield, we saw the worst of him. 
We saw him not being able to pass the ball sometimes. We saw that his, you know, his ball retention wasn't the greatest. His ability to transition or to carry the ball through the midfield wasn't the greatest. He couldn't find people through the lines. All the things that you want your midfielder from that position to do, he can't do because it's not your position. His best position is playing further forward, attacking midfield. Basically, he should be a player who should be rotated with the likes of Bruno Fernandes or Ericsson. I know that's crazy to say that, but he should be in that kind of slot. He shouldn't be trying to replace or be the backup to Amrabat or Casemiro. He should be the backup for Mount, um, Bruno Fernandes, Christian Eriksen, Donny van der Beek, all these type of people that midfielders in our team, Hassan Mej Mejbri, this is where McTominay should be. But because of his stature and because of maybe his willingness to play, he was played out of position, which essentially has unfortunately now solidified his opinion amongst most of the fans that he's not good. And now he has be limited to these short cameos and this past summer he was due to be sold right if you believe the rumors him alongside a few other players i think there was a list of six players that ericsson hug wanted sold and unfortunately he only got rid of one which was fred and fred only left because he wanted to leave to play football and i think now fred's at fenerbahce so mctominay's had a bit of a tough season because he knows he was surplus to requirements he had to stay because no one came in for him or because the club couldn't sell him because we're one of the worst selling clubs in the league also and then he has to stay and play on the bench and see the way that we're playing at the moment. And I think for me, the one of the United things that's a big issue is that we're so terrible at the moment that some of our crap players, I could imagine, they're probably a bad influence on the change room or they can probably upset the atmosphere, upset the apple cart, rightfully so. So imagine if you're Scott McTominay, people think you're terrible, cool. But you're now playing behind Casemiro who's also playing terrible. You have every right to feel like you should be playing even though you are terrible and you're not as good as him. So it creates a weird dynamic in the change room because the manager's only going to play the top players because he spent money on them and because they're quote-unquote his players and because they're on paper the better players. But the better players aren't playing that much better than the people that are on the bench and the people on the bench can't play because they've been classified as the shit ones. So it creates a weird dynamic in the, in the team overall. My in message on this was to say that in football and much like life, you have to look after yourself. You have to always look after number one. And I think that's been McTominay's one big mistake. Throughout his entire career, he never really threw his toys out of the pram. He never demanded to be played in a certain position. He never came out in the interview and said he wants to play in a certain position. He's not a defensive midfielder. He didn't push for a move to try and play in his favorite position. He never spoke about that sort of stuff. He just spoke about helping the team. He defended his performances, and that's basically it. But because he didn't make a stink out of the position that he was playing in and put that in people's head and try to um, dictate the narrative, it's now the narrative has been dictated on him that he's terrible at football, which he clearly isn't. He's not a good midfielder, but he can definitely be a good attacking midfielder for a decent enough club. You put McTominay in West Ham, you put McTominay um, in Everton, you put McTominay, um, who else in, he could play for? Even in Wolves, in that midfield position, transition, running forward, up and down, the lungs that he has, the fitness that he has, he will do really, really well. But unfortunately for United and the level that we're at and what we're trying to aspire to and the spotlight, him playing in deep landing midfield position isn't going to work, um, unfortunately. And I also think if he played further forward anyway, unless we're doing long balls, he probably wouldn't get a lot of the ball anyway because we don't really play well in those positions further forward. A lot of our plays usually come from the wings and stuff and whatever. He wouldn't really benefit from that. So I think much like football, you really have to look after yourself and you really have to make it known your displeasure, whether you're at work and you feel like people are overlooking your contributions and making it seem like you're not really a valuable member of the team or you didn't contribute something. You have to make it known. No, 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 no. Don't play with my name. I did this. I did that. They did this. They did that. But I played a crucial role in this. And if I didn't do this, this wouldn't have happened. You have to make it sure. Because if you just rely on the whole, like, you know, polite, almost immigrant mentality thing that I kind of grew up with, of like, no, your hard work will shine through. People know people that are doing well. They can see it. You don't need to say things. No, 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 no. no. You need to say things in this life. You need to make it known. Much like in football sometimes, when a player gets fouled, if they don't dive, they usually don't get the decision made given to them you have to make a meal of the tackle you have to make a meal of the supposed headbutt of the supposed touch in the box if you don't these referees life in general won't acknowledge you you won't get rewarded this idea that oh they're always going to spot the great people no they don't do great things and also make yourself very seen 
Make sure people see where you are. Wave your hand in the air, scream and shout like that person just did from my window just now and make it known who you are and what you're about. Because if you don't, people will dictate the narrative for you. And when the narrative is set, it's almost impossible to rewrite it. It's almost impossible to rewrite it. I've also been thinking a lot about gratitude, um, obviously, because of what's been going on um, in Israel at the moment, uh, what's been going on in parts of Palestine, because what's been going on in Gaza, and because of what's been going on with the Hamas attack and everything else that's kind of transpired. I feel like for the most part, if you live in a place that isn't war-torn, it doesn't matter if it's in the Western world, whatever it may be, that you should definitely feel a sense of gratitude because I look at some of the stories coming out of that place and I think to myself, what would happen if the UK was embroiled in some kind of war and we as civilians, as citizens, had to bear arms? The UK government said, hey, everyone that's able, um, male or female, or however you fucking represent yourself, if you're aged between 18 and 55, bear arms. Come and sign up. How long could we withstand the invasion or whatever it is? I think we'd be done in probably a couple of weeks we'd be relying on our army we would be relying on our special forces like we don't have the resolution the fortitude the grit um the desire or whatever it may be to do any of that right this country is so split and broken um via political socio-economic lines racial lines religion lines and like, it's not going to happen i don't even think you could get the whites of this country to agree on certain things right across the country doesn't matter if in the south or in the north even the whites don't agree on certain things so you know god forbid trying to get all the flipping others um to try and agree on something especially to fight um underneath the flag of the united kingdom or great britain or whatever it just isn't going to happen so i do have a lot of um uh, I do have a lot of sort of appreciation and respect for people abroad who are doing that parts of Ukraine and obviously the people um, between um, Israel and Palestine. It's absolutely tragic. I really do call for peace and wish for peace on both sides for sure. Um, but at this point, probably too much blood has been spilt for peace to really come about. Um, you could be as optimistic as you want, uh, hope as you want, but the amount of people's lives that have been torn apart, lives that have been ended, um, the things that people have seen, I just don't think there is any sensible way that they could really come around to the table and have some sort of peaceful resolution unless um, international uh, bodies step in and kind of mediate between them. But I just don't see it happening, unfortunately. Um, that's a really tragic part about it because been going on for what 100 plus years um there's a lot of stuff going on there that's way outside of my intellectual level in terms of understanding but it's so deep rooted um so much time has passed so many tears so many blood's been spilled that i just don't see how they're going to be able to get around the table and it made me think in general that's probably one of the reasons why war in general is so fucking abhorrent because really and truly you have a real short window to rectify a solution a peaceful solution you have a very short window to rectify it because once it goes over a certain window and once certain things have happened and, and, and usually in war people take advantage of that right people make money in during war times uh it's, it's sometimes within people's best interest certain nations i won't name them if the wars do continue and shit so they don't have any incentive to really stop it so it's really between the two factions, the two countries, the two opposing groups to actually sort out the issues before things get crazy, before the others start to kind of, you know, create noise and distraction or whatever it may be and get to a point where you can't re have any resolution. That's how crazy war is. But one of the worst and most tragic scenes from this um, Israel-Palestine situation that's been going on has definitely been one I have there on screen right now, courtesy of BBC. It says a headline. Like a horror movie, Israel music festival goers fled in hails of bullets. Can you imagine this? Like a fucking horror movie. This looks legitimately like one of the most scariest things I've ever seen in my entire life. Can you imagine being at a flipping festival, right? You know, pinging your head off, rolling, having a good time. Maybe you got some drinks in you. Maybe you just got the love of, you know, the love, the, the, the love of life in you right you're just feeling euphoric being surrounded by your friends doing the things that you actually enjoy and then suddenly 
you're in war mode you're having to be in survival mode running from a hail of bullets and to make it worse there's a scene that features like uh, allegedly like paragliders guys in like weird like parachute bun buggy things so it's basically they're flying they're jumping out of planes into this festival and they're and they've also strapped to these like buggy things that they can go and flip and drive to the flipping location of the festival and get people and you literally see people dancing and in the background you see parachutes landing behind them and they have no idea i remember that being one of the things um that i kind of kept in my mind when i was listening to one of these podcasts featuring one of these guys that goes up sk skyscrapers and does like backflips and hangs off of them he was basically saying oh it's a really amazing experience because you feel alone up there and no one's ever watching you because people rarely look up rarely if ever they're looking up so you can do all these crazy things above their heads they have no idea what's going on and how close you are to fucking falling it's fucking crazy but let's play the video itself this is coach of bbc it's a headline here i think it features some of the scenes that i was talking about previously <laughs> Jesus Christ. You hear the pa 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 and again, just imagine being in that festival like that. You're probably hearing a lot of noises. You're probably thinking there's crackers, there's poppers, whatever. It probably takes a long time to figure that stuff out, to process it in your brain. There's probably shock going on, like just so many emotions at the same time. But let me read the article. It says, For weeks, excited music lovers have looked forward to the Supernova Festival held in the desert of southern Israel to coincide with the Jewish festival of Sukkot. The time has come when the whole family is about to get together again. Organizers wrote on social media before it began so this is a family festival not even like a festival for caners it's just like a generic so a general festival for all the family during a specific religious holiday yo um the time has come and what fun it is going to be just hours later their social media pages are flooded with desperate people trying to find loved ones and after palestinian militants stormed the festival and opened fire as part of a huge surprise attack so probably on that post under the comments is people just trying to find all their family and friends on there. More than 250 bodies, more than 250 bodies have reportedly been recovered from the festival site according to rescue agency Zaka. One party goer called Ortel said the first sign that something was wrong was when the siren went off around dawn. Warning of rockets. Eyewitnesses said the rockets were quickly followed by gunshots. They turned off the electricity and suddenly out of nowhere, they militants come inside with gunfire opening fire in every direction. 50 terrorists arrived in vans dressed in military uniforms. 50 terrorists managed to kill 250 people. Of, of course, they were unarmed, maybe inebriated, just, you know, just not prepared for any kind of violence at all. So it just shows how quickly the numbers can just rack up in it. Um, people tried to flee the site, she said, running across the sand and getting into cars to drive away. But Pygoer said that their jeeps were full of gunmen, were full of gunmen shooting at their cars. Yeah, I saw a few of those videos as well. Like cars have been riddled with bullets and then come into a screeching hole. Like super sad, man. Like you see it driving off like someone actually behind the wheel. Then a few gunshots later, you see it kind of just like cruel to a stop. Like <sighs> they fired burst and we reached a point where everybody stopped their vehicles and started running. I went into a tree in a bush like this and they just started spraying people. I saw masses of wounded people thrown around and I'm in the tree and trying to understand what's going on. <sighs> I don't even know what the best thing to do. If that's something, if something that's happening to you, is the best thing to stay in a car and just keep driving as fast as you can? Or would it be to get on foot and try and do zigzags and whatnot? I don't know. I think probably getting into a car might be the best thing. Getting into a car and just kind of, I guess the only thing that would be bad is that if you get in the car and you duck down and just press your foot on the accelerator, you might run into somebody. You have no idea who's in front of you. But that might be the best way to do it. Just duck down, have your hand in the steering wheel. This feels like a movie. And just keep beeping your fucking horn and just drive as straight as you can and hope you get away. Because I think on foot, you have no chance really, in it. But again, I'm thinking about this all kind of armchair quarterback in it. I'm sure it's different when you're in the flipping situation. The festival site with three stages, camping area and a bar and a food area was in the Negev Desert near Kibbutz in Rim. It's not far from the Gaza Strip where... Um, Hamas fighters crossed over at dawn to launch their attack. They infiltrate towns and villages and taking tons of people hostage. That's the thing that I've only just realized recently, by the way, um, of recent years. I think because of Roy Perez, because of Yonti and a few other people. I didn't know that there's such a big scene of electronic music fans in Israel, 
in Palestine, in that part of the Middle East in general, I didn't know that was a thing. I really didn't until I kind of did a bit more research and find there was many clubs, especially even gay clubs out there that held a crazy parties, great little festivals and stuff, and a really thriving little scene, which makes sense though, isn't it? They were saying the places where there's a lot of conflicts and stuff, there's usually a pretty decent creative scene bubbling in there because it's the only outlet people have to kind of distract them from the horrors of their everyday life. But can you just imagine you're at a festival and this just happens out of the blue? Mid festival too, Jesus. Festival goer Adam Burrell told Havert, told Haretz that everyone at the rave had been aware that a chance of rocket fire in the area, but the gunfire was a shock. Like many others, he tried to escape in car, but the gunmen were firing at them, so they got out and ran. People were hit, we hid, everyone ran somewhere else. Wow, I don't know where even they. Where are you hiding then? If you've got people are shooting at cars, there's a video here with the cars all on fire. Let's watch this quickly. Jesus Christ wow there's a car just going through the camera in front of the car and left and right you just see cars flipped over burned abandoned just everywhere god almighty bro every car it just paints a story of a person in it it kind of reminds me of those chilling images of people from Auschwitz and stuff and all the shoes left behind and basically every shoe that was um taken off of people before they went to the concentration camps was just basically a person that passed away this is how tragic this car looks or the cars look it's the same sort of thing wow man so crazy um esther borochov told reuters that she was driving away when her vehicle was rammed into she saw a young man driving another car who told her to get in she did but the man was then shot at point blank esther said she played it until she was finally rescued by Israeli military the guy that got told to get into a car was shot this is like a movie oh my god let's watch this person speak about this issue flipping hell I was the first one to go out of the field. Still, people took them like two, three hours to go out and all the way people were dying, all the way on the road, young people. It's a festival for young people. Many, many people were dying in the road. Whoever tried to run away, they were shooting him from both sides. So best were to hide. A lot of people dead next to her. I was, it was unbelievable that she was able to escape because next, Right and left from where the car was there, there were bodies next, right and left. You can really see that the terrorists take, took out people from the car and just gunned them down. Jesus Christ, man. Jesus Christ, bro. Let's read the articles. Um, I couldn't move my legs, she told Reuters from the hospital. Soldiers came and took us away to the bushes. Many festival goers like Ortel hid in the nearby bushes and fruit orchids for hours, hoping the military to arrive and rescue them. I put the phone on mute and then I started crawling through an orange grove, she said. Live fire was whistling above me. They were going tree by tree and shooting. I saw people all dying all over. I was very quiet. I didn't cry. I didn't do anything. Eventually, after three hours, she heard some voice of Israeli soldiers and decided to make a run for safety. Oh my God. Can you imagine? Can you imagine having to play dead in such a scenario, knowing that they're going from p pillar to post, making sure everybody that they're shooting is actually dead, double checking, shooting again, and you're having to play dead. Oh, and obviously, thank God she has the foresight to put her phone on silent. Imagine you do all that and then your phone goes off because your mom's calling you. <sighs> Eventually, after three hours, she heard some voices of Israeli soldiers and decided to run. Um, another witness told Channel 12 it was four or five hours of a horror movie. We ran like crazy. It was just crazy. It was a massacre, said Yaniv, an emergency medic who was called out to the party. I've never seen anything like it in my life. It was a planned ambush as people came out of the emergency exit squads of terrorists were waiting for them and they started picking them off. That's just really, really, really tragic, isn't it? To go off to civilians like that is just abhorrent, really, to be a fair, isn't it? But then I guess it's abhorrent on their side too because they've been, you know, what they would describe as being occupied for many, 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 many years. Um, you know, there's been a lot of um, what people would deem to be racial cleansing going on over there. Um, literally you see videos of people literally being pushed off of their land you know what i mean dragged out of their homes kicking and screaming and shit it's just one of those things it's just human nature and you can't oppress people forever and think there's not going to be a reaction there's always going to be one reaction and i guess there are some people out there that are saying oh israel wanted this to happen because um you know the hamas went through the gates and the guards and the barriers and the checkpoints and all of these things and the borders way too easily and some people are saying that they maybe 
purposely left those places unmanned um, so that they could go through them easily and then obviously that could then spark um, the war and then allow them to declare um, you know basically um, the full-blown war and kind of get away with doing what they wanted to get away with from the very beginning I don't really know but I've just I just really really am hoping for peace on both sides but I also am not naive and I know that too much blood has been spilled and most likely this will never end until they probably both obliterate each other that's the unfortunate part and the only people that I really kind of cry for are the innocent civilians just trying to live their everyday life do you know what I mean their ones are going to be caught in the crossfire of all of this um there are loads of foreign interests involved who are profiting from this also and um yeah man it's always the regular civilians that suffer the most always um it says here there were three thousand people at the event they were probably so they probably knew it they had intelligent information friends and family members of the missing loved ones are now desperately hoping to find um to find them and of course that's the site of the festival <sighs> looks like a good festival to me right you've got the main entrance camping areas imagine you were in the camping area just tripping off mushrooms and shit I can't imagine. I just can't imagine how your brain would process all that shit. Among the missing is British man Jake Marlowe, who was working security guard. I think that's the guy that passed away, though. Is this the same dude that passed away in this other article I got? No, this is somebody else. Nathan Nathaniel Young, a British man serving Israeli military, killed in her mass attack. I'm RIP, man, Nathaniel. Jesus Chris. Um, another woman, 25 year old Noah Aragamani, is believed to have been taken hostage. Noah's friend, Amit. Par, 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 para told BBC that she was messaging her as she hid around 8 30 was the last message I got from her um, and it saw a video called the social media appearing to show her being taken captive it shows her on a motorcycle being oh that's her friend being taken away with her boyfriend you can see clearly her tarot going um, to Gaza Strip that's her other tactic that I've only seen during the Ukraine war recently of people not only going to kill but also going to get people as hostage. But usually the ones that I've seen from Ukraine, it's mostly soldiers. It's not innocent civilians. I've not seen this tactic. That's a crazy tactic. But I guess if you want to, um, if you want certain, you know, if you want your terms to be met, maybe the best way to do it is to grab innocent civilians because you know you basically put your um, the person you're opposing in in the, back them in a, into a corner. You put a lot of pressure on them to basically agree to your demands. It's a very sadistic, very cruel. But I guess in this game, you know, all bets are off. Um, the parents of 23-year-old American Israeli Hirsch Goldberg Pulin are also looking for their son who was there celebrating his birthday. They told the Jerusalem Post that they received two short messages from him says, I love you and I'm sorry. Fucking hell. At least 600 Israelis have been killed since the attack. 600. And whatever more Palestinians also from before and probably going forward. According to the latest figures of local media, the fight between Israeli military and Palestine militants is continuing and Israel has launched a wave of attacks on Gaza. The strikes have killed at least 413 people. Jesus Christos, bro. Again, I pray for peace on both sides. Absolutely tragic. Um, yeah, I just it's just the civilians that I just care about the most, to be fair. Really, really is tragic, to say the least. Absolutely tragic. One thing that isn't tragic, though, are all these celebrities jumping on to the wave of posturing and you know you know doing this whole virtue signaling thing by going out there and basically putting their flag in the ground and saying i support one or the other side um israel or palestine i don't understand personally especially if you have no personal investment in what's going on there or you don't really understand the situation it's, but but just in general if you're a celebrity of their of like kylie jenner's level there really is no reason for you to put a post out like this which is basically saying now and always we stand with the people of israel it's just like you probably don't know what's going on um it's probably way outside of your intellectual level like most of us and it just unnecessarily upsets a huge swath of people who are just trying to figure shit out. They're just trying to deal with this situation in real time. And the last thing they need are essentially US propaganda agents, right? Who probably don't know they're being used as agents, essentially disseminating weird um, false news out there or whatever they may be, or just distracting for the situation at heart. It really is weird. But just for the people involved, I don't know what the appeal is of doing these sort of things like why would you do this like why what's the appeal of putting these posts out because it i guess this is like the limit this shows you the limits of social media activism because this does absolutely nothing like even if you do have sympathy for israel even if you are really cut up about what's going on what does this post do what does this graphic do I don't think it does anything really and truly um but obviously it makes you feel good because it makes you look like you're somewhat aware of world issues and shit but i just feel like in some points there should be 
a default position that people go to when it's stuff that's outside of their purview it's like hey i feel bad for both sides i hope there's peace and just keep it moving or no comment because you don't know what's going on this standing with either side especially if you don't know what's going on is so odd it really is for social media points it's bizarre um in the small part because it just it just adds more pain and anguish to people and she obviously deleted this post um when it went crazy on her social media account so i could just imagine what her dms were like kaya Gemma's dms must have been on absolute fire do you know what i mean when she posted what she posted and again considering the the good little rebrand that she's been doing lately the link up with that timothy chamelet guy um the paris fashion week stuff the visuals everything she's done a really good job rebranding herself right in the last few months uh, or even a couple of years and all of a sudden you're embroiling yourself in this nonsense it's just it's just why you know you're giving yourself all this unnecessary hate you're basically turning a whole entire region against you it's just unnecessary necessary and really is um a short-sighted thing thing just goes to show the lengths or the hubris of some celebrities they honestly do think people are sitting there waiting to hear what kai jenner has to say about the ongoing conflict in fucking israel and palestine it's similar to the, the jaru thing isn't it i mean no like like they're sitting there thinking oh what does jaru think about this like no one's thinking at all zero like actually it's absolutely crazy that you'd go out there and put your you know put your flag in the, in the ground and then delete it as well that's the other thing that's really abhorrent if you actually feel the way you feel stand on it you know if you actually want to support israel stand on that shit that'd actually be way more commendable than getting scared and getting shamed out of supporting or standing for a certain people because people are being mean to you on social media like that's the antithesis of cowardice antithesis but again these people don't really know what they're talking about it's just all fucking social media credit points it's similar to the black squares it doesn't really do shit it's just whatever and then of course continuing on to not doing shit the uk government now wants to get involved and do this nonsense but again you know we shouldn't be involved at all it's the it's, it's the issue unfortunately people in that region of the world have to deal with on their own accord we don't really you know we should not be banding behind anybody really in my personal opinion um because then you have to see it all the way through and i don't think our government wants to do that because it's going to lead to some catastrophes but the headline here from the shade room says the uk government wants the government um buildings to fly the israeli flag in solidarity so have it be screened you know lit up on the on the front of like downing street as it is there and this flipping caption which is absolutely crazy it said uk government requested that the official government buildings fly the israeli flag in solidarity this comes after the latest emergency um emergence of conflict in gaza um continuing the long and historic war between israel and palestine the government also requested that buildings use appropriate lighting for the cause and then somebody in the comments of the of the shade room shade barasoy said this very interesting comment they said i wish i was exaggerating any of this but the level of sadistic oppression is truly insane palestinians are evicted from their homes on the daily and people who have moved from new jersey to israel are given those homes or if they are deemed illegal by the government they can be bulldozed israel don't license permits don't do not license permits to build in for palestines the closest comparison is to south africa apartheid the shit that Nelson mandela and ANC see over through in the 90s but this is an ongoing problem with no end in sight and the way that many folks around the world frame this as a religious conflict or muslims v jews is complete bullshit colonizers from western nations continue a process of ethnic cleansing that was started in 1948 to rid israel and palestine of palestinians they don't mince words about it they don't view palestinians as human only terrorists or vermin that need to disappear so this is a view of somebody who's down there with their feet on the ground is obviously a part of that community and you know by flying those flipping flags on the buildings you just upset a huge swath of people um you don't really know what's going on there's loads of you know it's really difficult to sort of spot who the bad actors are or who is good and who is bad in this sort of argument i guess there's shades of dark in both sides of things or whatever or maybe there isn't or maybe you just backed the wrong person in general we should be staying switzerland on this stuff staying neutral and keeping out of the way really and truly offering condolences and trying what we can do to help but not booing these fucking flags on the side it's absolutely crazy um but hey the UK government's going to do what the UK government's going to do. Again, we don't have HS2 Manchester, but we're going to fucking fly flags on the side of buildings and whatnot. And we've got people living in dilapidated council homes. Makes complete sense. Anyway, moving on from that one, there's this post courtesy of Twitter that I wanted to talk about, right? Because this reminded me of all the times that I've played in shocking, shocking raves during my life, right? And the caption says as follows. 
no more straight DJs at gay bars, please. And it shows this guy at playing at this bar is fully zoomed in. You can't see the out the you know what the club looks like. And if I'm not mistaken, he's playing some really aggressive Drake tune. And then the camera pans out and you see the whole entire club is empty, right? The dance floor is empty. There's a few guys in corners and stuff tapping their feet, but for the most part, no one's really vibing to the music. So clearly this guy didn't read the memo. Playing a gay club, you know, if you're gonna play Drake records, it has to be particular ones, but you can't play the the ones for the bros for the most part. And it kind of reminded me of one of my most legendary sets I played one time at some hostel where I got paid, like, I think the most I've ever been paid to DJ, which was like 600 pounds or something, right? Usually I'm at the, because I think DJs are tiers. Um, and I think, I think before I said like A tier, B tier, C tier, D tier, right? And I think each tier probably has three levels. But just to keep it simple, I'm, I'm at the 50 to $100 or $150 tier. That's basically my tier, right? At the moment, that's kind of where I'm at. And then as you continue on, your tiers kind of go up. But when I was still a proper 50 pound, $50 DJ, now I think I'm definitely, definitely worth more than 500 for sure. I could tear down most places, give me time to get my flipping stuff together and I'm tearing it down. Even a day's notice, I'm going to fucking destroy it. Doesn't matter if it's a gay bar, doesn't matter if it's a fucking house night, techno night, I'm going to do fucking good. But back then, I was definitely a $50, 50 pound DJ. And I got offered to play a gig that was $600, right? And which will obviously require a little bit more time to put those set together, understanding what you're playing and whatever, whatever it may be cool. But I don't really blame myself too tough because I remember before I took this gig at this hostel, they also had a bar. I asked the manager, what kind of music do they like? And he told me house music, right? And I guess in my naivete, I didn't try to specify or ask him what type of house music. I just thought, oh, house music. They probably want Marshall Jefferson. They want fucking uh, Mr. Fingers, you know, uh, Todd Edwards, whatever. They want house, right? Whatever. Or whatever I'm thinking in my head. Um, so I'm thinking house music. So I put house music. I put those Chicago house there. I put some good ha little bait song house tunes. I get there and guess what kind of house they actually want? They want like house, like FIFA music house, you know, like big room, hands in the air type of house. And I got it completely wrong. So I'm playing all these classic house records that would usually destroy most little clubs that I would go to. But in this hostel come bar place, it's crickets. People are hating it. They're asking me to play this, play that, play this. And I'm getting so many requests. I'm getting Rihanna requests, Destiny Child requests. Like, like, what is going on? Didn't you ask me for house? And you asked me for Rihanna and bashment music. So I started to do the juice box thing, which is definitely a big mistake. If you're a DJ, then you get played to ask to play somewhere. And unfortunately you prepare the wrong things or doesn't go well just play your set don't turn into the jukebox guy because it could get even worse and you start sweating and you start trying to chase the approval of those people that are asking you for certain tunes just die on your sword just die 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 but in this particular case with this video i honestly do think oh yeah and then obviously i got paid 600 pound at the end of the thing and i literally have never felt more ashamed of taking someone's money than on that really occasion when it comes to these type of sets or you're playing in these type of arenas and you're spending maybe in a space that you're not too familiar with and the dance floor is completely empty and you're seeing that the stuff that you came with isn't necessarily working you need to have a little bit of self-awareness a little bit of self under a little bit of understanding you need to have be able to be humble enough to let yourself know that it's going terribly hey it's going bad no one's on the dance floor you're a dj you kind of work in the service industry you're meant to make people dance if they're not dancing if they're not on the dance floor having a good time if they're not having a drink going a bit crazy enjoying the time with their friends you're not doing your job properly so you need to be humble enough to accept that and try your best to rescue it because this is rescuable it probably takes only five tracks to get a group of people who don't mind being the center of attention to jump near the front of the booth to want to set the standard of the party all it takes is five tunes probably maybe even less to kind of get them back on track because at the moment if you see the actual video i'm looking i kind of paused it but looking at the, at the dance floor there are some people in the sort of like balcony type area there's a couple of guys here there might be some people here the one that's filming is there too so you can see where the dj is in the middle of the room that he can see the pockets of people you can see the bartenders there who are also usually a good sign of whether or not you're doing good or not because sometimes you know there might be a, one or two bartenders there that are like tapping their feet nodding their head at what they like and shit so you could basically gauge where you're at on the night 
with different people in different corners. You can spot the person at the back taking bumps, the person in the toilet, you know, whatever, loitering, the person at the bar waiting for the drink, the bartender, the, um, you know, that's kind of having a good time and not just there to work and wants to have a good time and party also. You can use those as gauges. And then you have to do everything in your power, everything in your power to get people back on the dance floor. But I don't think people do that enough. There's all, there's all this, this attitude. I think it also exists in stand-up comedy where it's like, oh, it's a crowd, man. The crowd didn't get me. I'm too heady for them i'm too advanced i'm too this i'm too that it's like no 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 especially djing at this sort of level you are in a service industry you're playing at some random bar a cocktail bar that's not really a club it's mostly like a bar that has people play music in it but you are at their beck and call you need to do a good job for them that's what you need to do if you don't do a good job for them and i think i said it before in a tweet actually talking about this you have to actually go out on your fucking sword you need to go out and give it everything. You have to play your best stuff, try to get these guys back on song, try to get them back on the dance floor because most likely you're not going to get back invited again. That's a really cutthroat, you know, side of event promotion, DJing or just, you know, nightlife. If you're not able to get people out on the dance floor dancing to the stuff that you're playing, if you're not, you know, if people are not hyped to see you, you just won't get booked again. It's really kind of black and white, especially at the highest levels where you're trying to sell tickets. It really is a numbers game. Unless you sell tickets, people are just not going to fuck with you. So in this case, this guy who's DJing has to try everything in his power to get his people back on song because more than likely, the text has already been exchanged. Whoever is the manager today, the bar manager, is probably already on a text with the manager, with the event booker and saying, hey, this guy's fucking horrible. He's playing fucking ludicrous. He's playing Styles P. He's playing fucking Soldier Boy at this gay bar. It's not going well. Like this guy's trash. They're probably already trashing you. So if you want to rescue it, do that. Or what I like to do sometimes, if it was going terribly, I just want to leave and have my head held high. Because I, again, I have this, maybe it's an immigrant mentality thing. I want to feel like I've earned and I'm deserving of the money. I don't want to just fleece people out of their money. I want to provide a service. I want to try my best and give it my all. And then I'll take your money gladly because we're exchanging my expertise and my time for money. But I'm not going to phone it in. I'm going to play there like if i'm playing at panorama bar i'm gonna play there like i'm playing at Burkine. i'm gonna play there like i'm playing at fold like i'm playing at palomas like i'm playing at fucking phonox whatever i'm gonna give it my all and if that doesn't work fair enough but i'm not gonna just phone it in and just play my things and satisfy myself because it's empty no 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 it's your job to get those guys and girls back on the dance floor and you can it's possible it's going to be difficult because you already, he probably had people on the dance floor. Then he met, that's probably the worst thing. He probably ran them out. I, I bet you there was a small group of people around. Then they started feeling awkward because there's so much space in the front and everyone can see you. So they sort of moved off into corners. You went up to the balcony and whatever it may be. That's where the wrong place. But if, you, if, if it's not the case, you can definitely rescue them. But it takes some work and effort. And again, um, I think like this is where i got my best training because i also remember playing in like warehouse raves right um in different places in hackney and shit and i think i'm actually trying to get a video a clip of it and include it into this podcast as i'm talking also but i remember playing in those kind of warehouse raves and basically as long as your music you're playing is at a certain bpm you can't do no wrong you really can't everyone's gonna love you so you know it's not really the best place to sort of learn how to DJ. The best place to learn to DJ is to go to places where people don't know you, obviously, and they're also maybe a bit picky and maybe it's a bit of a normie crowd that can actually teach you how to read the crowd and how to also play your own thing because sometimes you can get into the habit of trying to be a people pleaser and you turn into a human jukebox which you shouldn't do you should have the things that you want to play but you still have to be open to maybe taking in different directions based on people's requests or just based on the feeling and the atmosphere of the room and then then you can take that learning and apply it to big clubs because i feel like big clubs and venues and shit especially at the highest level for me i feel like you know Dixon could play one tune at one BPM for an hour and a half at any club in the world and everyone's going to love it. That's not really a mark of a good DJ. I feel like Dixon probably learned how to DJ properly when he was obviously coming up being a resident DJ in Berlin, playing house sets for like six plus hours, being rarely unknown. 
and having to follow somebody hard or having to be before or having to open for somebody really popular do you know what I mean so you're having to maybe keep them on the dance floor you may be having to you know maybe try to get them on the dance floor whatever it may be it's a hard job to do but it's over six hours you have to create a sort of like ambiance a journey you cool can't be one tempo all those things are really skills that then could be applied into playing festivals and when you get to a festival you're playing two hours of course it's a piece of cake because you've done so many sets and reps of six plus hours in clubs when people don't really know you or don't want you to be there and you're killing it so of course take that and synthesize it at two and you're gonna smash it again that's just tips out there for my fellow djs and for anybody who works in the service industry always be pleasing always be pleasing in my humble personal opinion next on the list we've got this clip this clip is kind of sad i'm not gonna lie um it doesn't bring me much joy to play this but i need to kind of talk about this so this clip kind of features if i'm not mistaken it features the one and only dj academics and kai cena and essentially the reason why i'm playing this clip is because um dj academics and drake have got this weird relationship where i think it's very one way i think academics definitely loves drake more than Ac drake loves academics obviously he always says that drake is his goat drake is basically his jay-z the guy is gonna ride or die for which is fine um but drake i don't think thinks Ak is cool and he isn't that's the issue with Ak. he is one of the biggest content creators bloggers platforms in the hip-hop space especially in america but he's severely uncool he basically represents the side of hip-hop fan bases that most artists don't want to communicate with i think most artists are aware that most of their fans probably look more like academics than kai Cena, but they would rather have their fans look like kai Cena than academics but unfortunately, they all look like Ak. Most rap fans, especially the ones online, the ones that are most vocal, right? They're kind of dorky, probably fat looking type of dudes. So because of that, I don't think Drake wants to associate with him. And obviously also, I think because of academics, his loud mouth, the fact that he goes after certain people. Just recently, he was involved in a beef with fucking Scissor. He's got this weird thing where he just goes off at anyone. Um, even, you know, he, I don't think he's specific to men or women. He's just got a tendency to bark at anybody from the comfort of his own, you know, from the comfort of his studio um, because that's what he does. And he's really good at it, to be completely fair. And maybe that is kind of made drake to keep him at arm's distance maybe i think it's a bit unfair though because i think he does deserve a bit of a recognition from drake because he holds him down in a big way i know drake doesn't ask for it but having one of the biggest most popular hip-hop blogs out there be one of your biggest fans that's bound to be good that can't be a bad thing so the fact that drake doesn't acknowledge him at all publicly at least is a little bit bad mind in my personal opinion but i also understand that from drake's point of view because as much as i like Ak, he's hella lame like let's be real the guy is really lame um uh, but this kind of broke my heart i'm not gonna lie um Ak was doing his whole entire stream it probably totaled to more than 24 hours where he was doing a whole um you know uh, prelude to for all the dogs by drake dropping it dropped i think a couple of hours later than that also so he probably stayed up the whole time uh, with his discord talking about the whole thing and really kind of digesting the whole album and drake was then doing the whole thing of calling certain people i think there's a picture of him watching kai cena on stream you didn't see a picture of him watching Ak on stream he allegedly called Ak before but Ak was on mute allegedly um and then he called kai cena live on stream and the story goes that kai cena actually asked academics for the drake's number drake calls him on stream they have a quick little powwow then it flips over to ak trying to call drake and drake doesn't pick up the phone i just feel really bad for ak man it's sort of like representative of like industry friendships are never really what you think they are and i think this has been a lesson or this has been something i remember joe budden saying would be a really hard lesson for academics once he gets a bit more famous and he starts be hanging around rappers more he'll notice that these guys aren't really his friends he thinks they're his friends but they're not and i think he's starting to realize that now as much as you do for them as much as you have little back and forths on fucking social media and you think that's a something it's not really anything just kind of you know enjoy the friendship for what it is from afar but don't think it goes any further they're not going to do you any favors and they're definitely not going to come out here and you know declare their love for you especially if you're dissing people that they like or they love and shit it's not going to work so let's play the video anyway and see what it's saying and then we can go from there Somebody's calling me, chat. Guys, uh! <laughs> hey, stop playing with these niggas, bro! Bro, you about to need an EpiPen. Hi, okay. <laughs> and you know, 
I ain't, you know, I touched on a few hours ago. That right, we going up. Yes, I'm, I'm going to be in Toronto, bro, for the last two shows. Come on, Gengo. Come on, Gengo. Come on, Gengo. This shit. Oh, yeah. 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 Yo, Gengo. Hey, bro, this shit was worth the wait. I've been streaming for 10 hours, gang. Yeah, yeah that, that was that 12 a.m. surprise. 6 a.m. was kind of crazy, but it's but but it's them ones. It's one of them ones. Uh huh. Appreciate appreciate the love. Shout out. I, I see all the W's dropping. Like that's that's a lot. Right. That's a lot of love. You know. I, be, I watch. I always watch the. He's shouting out the chat and all sorts. And if I speed up a little bit, you'll see it switch over to Act the last few seconds, and Act then tries to call Drake, and it doesn't go as well. Let's switch over there. I'm going to see if I can get the boy on the phone before I get out of here. Damn, man. Let's see if I can get a shot with him real quick. He pulls out a shot for himself up early in preparation. Look, he's smiling to himself. He's happy. I'll he's about to speak early. to his guy. Let's see if I can get the boy on the phone. He's really looking forward to it. He looks like his phone. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Just to call him. He's smiling. Mm. I ain't get the answer, man. <laughs> He'll hit me back. He'll hit me back. Your call's been forwarded, and he rubs his face and kind of just tries to play it off. And I'm like, wah, wah, wah. But also, I feel bad for him. You know what I mean? It's not a laughing matter. It's just, it's one of those unfortunate lessons you have to learn very early on in, the career, in your career in the industry. I think this is something that I was always very aware of, um, which is why I kind of operate the way that I operate or move the way that I move, especially within the DJing scene in general. I could easily try and be that, oh, I want to be certain people's friends type of guy, but I've never really been that guy. I've always enjoyed the ability to be like a customer and a normal punter and approach these things just like a fan, like a fan would. Shout out to people that I want to shout out with, with no expectation of them acknowledging me or wanting to be my friend or hanging out and shit. I don't really give a fuck about that stuff. If they do, fair enough, but it's not anything that I'm chasing for. I'm not really bothered. I mean, I already have a fun and fulfilled life. I'm away from that. I don't need to seek the validation of um, people in the industry. But I can understand in, in Axe position, he's way more popular than I am way more richer than i am at the moment so clearly in his position he's talking to way more high caliber people especially even if you're the hip-hop right it's not dance music so obviously if drake hits him back it's way more you know it, it's way more it's more to shout about than if fucking vtss was to hit me back do you know what i mean that's who who gives a fuck but when it comes to drake and stuff hitting him back or him on the on the dms and liking his comments and shit that could hit different and that can make you sometimes have this false idea that these guys are your friends but they're not that's the harsh reality of it you think they're your friends but they're not actually your friends and it's a tough pill to swallow it really is but the quicker you do the better because again i was saying before like there is something about content generation there is something about this cultural commentary type of scene thing where it kind of makes people think that because they spend a lot of time speaking about things that it somehow makes them the guy or the girl you feel like you're a part of the culture now because you're speaking about things. You think you're on the same level as the people who are making the things that you're speaking about. It's never going to be that. You're always going to be looked at a little bit lower than them, maybe just a bit above the consumers, uh, maybe on the same level as the consumers, really, but you're not an artist. You will never be until you do the art, right? But sometimes I think because of the speaking, because of the platform, you feel like you're a valuable, you feel like you're a way more important person than what you are. You're just a platform that everyone's using that because you're around it's not people care more about what you have to say it's just you're the one that happens to be around you're the biggest so people kind of fuck with you the most but i think when you're in this commentary scene it just gives you this false sense of self you think you have i don't even show this delusions of grandeur it's just a weird thing i see it happening with a lot of people and i really hope it doesn't happen to me but i see a lot of people have this weird switch in their head where they start to feel like they are the same you know it's like i don't know it's just not the same thing at all play position i feel is the best advice for anybody and then kind of take it from there really but again you know what do i know when it comes to this sort of stuff um i just kind of felt a little bit bad for ak because he goes so hard for deep for for drake but drake doesn't really fuck with him like that you know what i mean doesn't really fuck with him like that but again what do i know
Moving on from that, I want to talk about this quickly. This is courtesy of One Granary, and they posted this really interesting and divisive and really contentious post regarding um, the recent appointment of Sean McGreer or Sean McGear, sorry, at um, Alexander McQueen. And the post is following, it says the follows, right? It's a little caption they put together. Sean McGear is replacing Sarah Berta as Anna McQueen. These are the caring's creative directors and it features everybody from the caring group who's the creative director there and basically they're all very very white and i guess the caption also kind of speaks a bit more on it and it says as follows with the appointment of sean mcgear at alexander mcqueen all the creative directors at caring fashion houses are now white men the quote says i literally don't know a single woman of my generation even approached for a job like this a senior designer shared after the news that the head of men's at jw anderson would succeed sarah burton started circulating another quote all these women have given up everything to service men pay 10 times their salary Another woman designer shared her frustration with us. It is insulting to every woman working in the industry, not him being appointed, but having a full portfolio headed by men. We hear so much about quote unquote change, while diversity and equality are used as a marketing strategy every day. But in truth, nothing seems to have evolved. The quote, I think so many women just give up because of the route is so impossible. This appointment proved it. It is high time we engage with a difficult conversation about why these decisions keep repeating themselves in the industry and what factors perpetuate this pattern and why actual change remains so elusive. Now, this is an interesting topic for me because being a aspiring DJ in my kind of field that I'm in on the genre that I kind of, you know, specifically want to get involved in, which is house and techno, I view this from a very different lens also because it's kind of an interesting parallel. Right, hear me out. So I've seen within my journey in the scene over the years that although I have a very good understanding of the music, I'm a really competent and good DJ. I've been around for a while. I know how to play. I know the parties, all the stuff. I'm, blah, 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 blah. I'm still very down on the pecking order of people and priorities when it comes to certain opportunities because I happen to be a black straight male. And I feel like, unfortunately for me, even though I tick some diversity, inclusivity boxes, I'm not viewed that way just because I don't lean a particular way. Even though I'm, you know, I'm very open to going to most of these parties. I go to them all the time. I'm always championing a lot of them, which doesn't mean I deserve to play there, don't get me wrong. But just more so that, you know, I don't really have an issue at all with that community at all. I don't really look at it that way. I just look at the good parties and I try to attend them. And obviously, you know, whatever I can attend and take part in, I will take part in. But I've noticed definitely in the hierarchy or in the totem pole of opportunities, I definitely fall right down the bottom, maybe just above, you know, what you deem to be called white cis men i'm definitely probably above them but i'm definitely one of the last ones that would probably try to get picked or get an opportunity to play somewhere which is a real shame but then i think about it on the sense of if i was a white cis male and i was in the djing field i would also feel a bit annoyed because for the longest time there was a real stranglehold on the DJing opportunities and the scene that existed. I think it's the same now, to be fair. I don't think anything has really changed, even though it's all like inclusive and whatnot and POC friendly and LGBTQ this. It's still the same 10 to 20 LGBTQ centric DJs playing at the same parties, whether it's Infernos, whether it's Budokai or whatever. It's still the same top 20 ones, really and truly. Um, so it hasn't really changed in if anything it's just they just replaced the top with another type of top um you know no pun intended but i think if i was a white cis male i'd feel a little bit aggrieved because for the longest time a particular group of white cis males like the marco carolas the ricardo villalobos's the richie all these type of dudes they had a stranglehold on all the opportunities you couldn't play if you weren't those type of dudes or you weren't on their level then all the Jamie Foxes and Jamie Fox, sorry, the Jamie Joneses, the Seth Chocolers, um, all these type of dudes come around and they have a stranglehold on opportunities. So you can't have opportunities anymore. Now there's a whole entire scene coming up of this guy called Jaden Thompson, a few other people coming up and they have a stranglehold on it. But they have a stranglehold on it. They also tick diversity boxes. So if you're a white cis male, you don't really have an opportunity to come through because they're trying to push a particular type of person forward and make it de and make the scene look like it's more inclusive and diverse than what it actually is 
so the problem that exists i feel like and the same problem that exists in fashion is not that it's not inclusive it's just that it's not really interesting when it comes to hiring i think most of these people that have been hired so far that we're seeing on this list on this kind of square this graphic they've got on here for each group uh, i can recognize um i can recognize the designer for bottega veneta i recognize the designer for balenciaga the designer i'm not really sure who the other ones are i think this is the one for gucci and i don't know who the other three are but essentially all these designers if i'm not mistaken are all people who worked behind the scenes in fashion like you have the guy that's been approached now or has got the job now for example mcqueen well the head of men's were jw anderson so somebody that is well known to people behind the scenes he's definitely got a lot of you know um got a lot of kind of reputation got a great reputation probably you'd imagine for his work definitely high regarded and now he's getting given the opportunity to you know perform on the high stage that's what we should be promoting because now it gives kids in fashion schools the hope that if they do go work underneath somebody they could also be the head of alexander mcqueen when before it was oh you have to be a celebrity designer you have to be well known like a virgil to get those type of jobs now the industry is showing you that hey if you actually grind and you're just there in the background pattern cutting and shit you may be able to get one of these higher jobs it's actually a good thing so the issue is that the industry has moved so slow in promoting people who actually have knowledge of what they're doing have the expertise have the education then now they're at loggerheads because they took so long to employ people in the design studio who deserve those jobs just as much as any high-flying celebrity designer that now the diversity arguments come about they're having to do two things at once they're having to address trying to lift up voices and people within the industry who don't who get overlooked and they're also having to be inclusive and diverse to reflect the amount of people that are into the stuff that they do so it's a weird situation to be in but when it comes to the women thing it's a bit hard because i remember that one time ages ago where i was randomly cycling through central central london i my bike got a puncture and i happened to end up outside vogue house and i didn't know what vogue house was before i was in front of it i ended up in there i ended up outside of there trying to fix my bike and at the same time i was trying to fix my bike with a puncture the fire alarm in vogue house went off and all of these girls that work in Vogue House came out. I just remember being there thinking, rah, bro, all these fucking girls and thinking, shit, hot girl, hot girl, it's in my head, right? I was thinking, hold on, is this Vogue House? That's the Vogue, oh, that's the Vogue head office. Shit. And then the second thing that put in my head, was like, rah, boy, there's a lot of white girls in there, isn't it? Like, it was crazy. Like, again, my brain doesn't think that way usually, but I couldn't help but notice how many of the same type of, you know, Labbrook Grove, Notting Hill type of white woman that was pouring out of Vogue House. I was like, oh my God, bro. That is really interesting. It's like hardly anybody else that does not look like that in their office. A very particular type of white person. I was like, shit. Okay, that's weird. So, most likely again i haven't worked in the background of fashion i've been a fan all my life of course i've collected magazines i've gone to shows i've been part of different whatever but i've never really worked in the industry industry but i would assume much like you know casting and stuff most likely the fashion industry is probably predominantly full of women predominantly right predominantly in every aspect in every level so it's really difficult to sit here with a straight face and say that there's not a lot of opportunities for women when the entire industry is full of them yes maybe the high level opportunities the ones at the top aren't going to some women that's obviously unfortunate but it is a kind of a, a privilege issue really it's not really an issue that i feel like is encompassing of the work industry overall because there's not an abundance of women out here who are fighting you know men to get fucking construction jobs right they want certain jobs only and again the balance needs to be restored i understand that but it's a very tricky situation because if you then say hey we want more women to get these type of jobs why can't a black straight guy like me get that kind of job either why don't i get involved in the situation why am i then now at the same level or if not underneath or maybe above you know your kind of um white male type of figure person it's a strange place to go in so it kind of gets into thinking of like in the end the only way to deal with these sort of issues the fair way is to just say we're not gonna hire people based on their sex or their race we're gonna base hire people based on their talent and their ability to do the job which doesn't happen nowadays because of social media because of whatever it's just not a thing that happens so that's obviously mute but that's the only way to deal with this fairly 
because if you start doing the diversity quota store things it can get very murky it can get very contentious very 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 quickly that made me think of like figuring out or typing on google oh what is diversity in it like what, what is the point of all that who started this whole thing right why do we need to have workplaces that look you know multicultural and shit like what's the point of all this so i randomly stumbled on this article that kind of delves on it a little bit this is courtesy of a website called diversity.social it says why diversity is important so let's read a little bit of the articles and see what it's saying it says diversity is important in today's workplace because it helps us learn from each other and understand that everyone is unique and special in their own way which is a crazy way to start an article like this right the only way the only reason why diversity is good is to help us learn surely workplace diversity shouldn't be about learning workplace diversity should be about getting the best people working for you no matter where they are who they are so that it can benefit your bottom line right it's a capitalist thing that's not about learning and cultures and understanding what fucking pounded yam is and shit it's about sales it's about making money so the idea is hey let's not limit ourselves to caucasian white girls let's open the studio to everybody who has a love for fashion who has experience so that they can contribute and that they can help us sell more magazines which will then allow us to you know um, make more money or get more ad space whatever it may be but it should always be about money it shouldn't be about learning about people's cultures that's fucking crazy in my opinion Diversity is important for several reasons, both in society and various contexts, such as workplaces, education and communities. Here are some key reasons why diversity is important. It enhances creativity and innovation, allegedly. Better decision making. It encourages learning and personal growth. Improved performance. Fosters inclusivity and social cohesion. Enhances adaptability and resilience. Reflects and serves the needs of the diverse populations. Economic benefits. Um, and nine, social justice and equity businesses should never be in the business of social justice and equity really and truly especially those high fashion um brands and those fashion houses they should be in the business of selling clothes they should be in the business of making beautiful clothes that people want to buy and selling tons of them so they can make more beautiful clothes and keep selling them so you can keep buying them it shouldn't be about equity and all this sort of nonsense if anything the most thing a brand should do is reflect the customers i think that's one of the things that used to annoy me early on about vetement when it first kind of got popping it was very evident that black people and asian people gravitate to vetement aggressively i know i did i bought some of the first fucking triple s's i bought loads of stuff from there very early on and um, brand new jeremy you know spent a lot of money on that fucking shit when it first dropped um and clearly you know that was the main talk that was the main audience that i saw where vetement daily it was only me and asian people that live around me cool it was really annoying when you saw the runway and you just saw, you know, obviously them as friends and their clique and their crew at the time. And it wasn't reflective of the fan of the fan base or the Philippine buyers or the customers. Sorry. That was anything that kind of annoyed me. Like, why are you just completely ignoring a huge part of your fan base and not reflecting on the runway? Because that's just an easy sell when you see some guy that looks like you or whatever on the runway, looking at something cool. It just might click in your brain. Some people are a bit simple minded that way. I know I am. Oh, shit. I could wear that, too. That color would work good on my skin as well. Boom all of a sudden now you're you're keeping an eye out for a neon green hoodie it doesn't really take much but the idea of just hiring black or brown or women or whatever it may be just because of their race is ridiculous you should obviously be open to anybody especially if they're in uh, walking distance or whatever to your fucking workplace but it shouldn't be just be hiring based on color of the skin alone that's not how businesses should work in my personal opinion and like i said when it comes to fashion it's tricky because fashion inherently is women dominated right there's a lot of women working in this industry or in fashion or in general so how do you then pass and how do you decide how to kind of allocate these roles if there is an issue with representation and diversity or whatever how do you address that because there's many women working on levels underneath being the creative directors at fashion brands i don't think all fashion brands are helmed or led by white gay men I, I don't believe that. I refuse to believe that. I know there's a lot of white gay men working in fashion, but I don't think they dominate it. I think there's a lot more women working in fashion than there are white gay men. So that's a fact. How do you address the balance? Because there's guys like myself, if I want to be a creative director of a fashion brand, what then do I have to do? I have to wait fourth, fifth in line behind everybody else because I just happen to be a man and I happen to be straight and I happen to be black. Like it's just annoying. Do you know what I mean? Um, so obviously, I think the issue is more so with the company's inability to kind of um identify talent because look at all the hires they've done in these houses so far they're obvious 
of course Matthew Williams is going to get a job at a big luxury house because look what he's doing with Alix on his own, a startup company. Of course, a, a house would want to take a chance on him because he has huge pull. The association with Virgil, the Kanye thing, it makes sense. Of course, Virgil will get the big job at Louis Vuitton at that time. Of course, of course, Pharrell would get it, even though maybe on paper, you know, design chops, he doesn't have it. Because of his pull and his cachet, it makes complete sense. But again, they're the obvious hires. They're not making clever hires. And I think nowadays as well, don't be a, don't be fooled i don't think they're hiring these people from behind the scenes obviously you know maybe excommunicating demler because of the great work he did at vetema but i don't think they're hiring a lot of these people behind the scenes who are quote-unquote unknown because they are somehow now plugged in and more aware of what's going on no 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 they're only doing this because i think because of the financial constraints most likely because of the economy being the way it is it's probably way more economically sound to hire people from in-house who are basically working in the industry or whatever it may be then hiring some big glitzy person um you know a famous streetwear person who's probably represented by caa or wme who's going to demand a crazy contract crazy working conditions it's just too much so you'd rather hire some of the industry who's going to be happy to have the job who's going to feel like you know very it's going to be feel validated for being seen by one of these big houses and it's going to take whatever deal that crosses their table that's probably why they're doing it so it's definitely a cost-effective thing, mask as, oh, we are now keeping abreast of the fashion industry and seeing who's around. It's not, it's not that. So unfortunately, this is a very complex issue. It's not very easy to just say, hey, let's give this person, that person a job. It's just a complex issue that's hard to really address. But I feel like the only way to really address it is to scrutinize the industry and scrutinize these big brands and tell them, hey, try thinking outside the box. Don't go for the easy option. Try and hire people based on the talent that you see. Even if they don't have a big following or whatever it may be, take a chance on somebody because that might be the next big person that you might stumble upon who might be the next Sarah Burson, for instance, right? Take a chance, take a punt, but they don't usually. They try and go for the easy, safe method that ticks all the boxes and then continue on. That's the issue that we have at the moment. But I went to read some comments here from people as well because they had some interesting things to say regarding this whole issue. So let's read some of the granary comments here on here to see what the vibe is saying. Um, one person said the following. What I find interesting is that when I studied fashion, men were by far the minority. So that they make up so that they make up the majority in her positions is questionable. Seems we're still within the headspace that men are perceived as being more capable to lead and take reins than women, you know, help. I don't think that's true, but there's also a refusal to accept that women majority women offices are usually not usually can sometimes be a very different experience to work in than an office that's led by men it's just what it is we don't know why that is maybe it's just temperament whatever but there is that might go into some of the thinking behind it but i don't think it's like that to be fair i think it's probably a lot more complex than that but this is a good um sort of point to sort of jump off from another one imagine women not given a chance to design clothes for women true another one women are overrepresented in the fashion at every level so with all due respect put up or shut up i don't think that makes any sense to be fair um you know you can't just tell every woman to start a brand brands are expensive to start they're not easy to start and it shouldn't be a requirement to get a big creative job really and truly if you know what you're doing especially within fashion in terms of design you should be more than likely especially with the teams that they have internally you should be able to be given a chance at these places to try to do something because most likely you're going to smash it um, especially if you have all the tools given at your disposal another one says sean is lovely give him some love he needs our support agree another one says good to see we're all listening and learning i'm so unbelievably bored of this another one saying it's everywhere and it starts already from school on my year at CSM at MA, we were more women than men in the class. For the final show out of the 15 collections that were picked up by to be shown, only okay, this is a bit crazy. If this is true, this is crazy. On my year, one year of CSM at the MA, they say, we were more women than men in the class. For the final show out of the 15 collections they presented that were picked up by the show, only three were women. I was astonished then, but am I surprised now? Okay, that is crazy, but then the, res the retort back could be, were the women good though it's objective i know but were they were they commercially sound did they fit the theme i don't know whatever the term is were they good i don't really know 
but that's a crazy thing to say um, and comment to make there because that definitely shows you maybe some of the issues that are going on there. Um, while I do enjoy a lot of their work, I have to say that the women deserve to be in, the, in these roles. They are not less talented. They are just anonymous, so we don't know what they are capable of. Another one says, white men for spring, groundbreaking. Another one. You, saying that when you're white is always funny. Uh, another one says, not to be forever contrarian, but even in the relative contemporary terms, concerning who has been most influential in revolutionizing fashion, Ray Kawakubo, Andy Lemuster, Jill Sander by leaps and heaps and bounds, Anne Valerie Hash, Rodarte, Margaret Howe, oh, Margaret Howe, the legend, um, not even to mention the actual massive stadium sellers such as Stella McCartney, Vera Wang, Donna Karen, D Diane von Forsberg. Does this mean... Does this meme appear completely one-sided? Absolutely. Is it true? Yes. However, let's not discount that many women who are just as important as their male counterparts, if not more influential. And I haven't even said Chanel. Even in fashion, appearance isn't everything. The vast majority of photography editors are all top magazines are women and have been for the last 30 years and still mostly hire men. It's not a singular gender issue. It's interwined. Exactly. That's the term. It's interwined. It's a complex interwined issue. That's the one I was trying to look for the word. Thank you for this user. And I can't wait to see the next generation of incredible designers who also happen to be women, not quote unquote women designers, but um, just amazing designers who, despite the state of affairs at Kering, show us a new path forward, such as Jill Sander did at the height of the 90s, Ray Kalkuba did in the 80s, and Andy Muster did up until she realized social media had ruined fashion and departed at the correct moment, for sure another one says continuing this perverse fantasy dystopian world where white men dictate what and how women dress while never walking in the woman's shoes true but they do it really well to be fair and fashion you know just because you don't wear heels doesn't mean you can't design great heels you know it's a very straight it's a really strange way to look at things but hey what do i know six pictures of the same man that's funny and everyone says they were really they really said copy paste six times <laughs> i love this whole like self-hating white thing is all happening it's really funny um yes i just i was just thinking about this today thank you for calling this out when i studied in middlesex men made up of 20 percent of the graduating class but year after year appointment after appointment all the new creative directors are men how is it possible that all just happen to be more talented than all the women who work 10 15 years in industry this is fucking sexist i literally cannot tell at first if this photo was all the same man it's a, it's a fashion industry sexist. I can't believe that, to be fair. Male models get paid less. Women models get paid more. The industry is dominated by women, but just the top jobs happen to go to most, mostly men. I don't know why that is. Maybe there's an issue with a lot of women maybe not wanting to go for those jobs. Maybe there's not a lot of women designers. Maybe... um. I don't know. There must be something going on. I don't know. It's complex. I don't know what the issue is, but I can't sit here and be say with a straight face that I agree that the fashion industry is sexist because it sounds as similar to like people who go to Bergheim get turned down and then say oh Bergheim is racist or it's homophobic it's like just because you didn't get in does it mean that it's racist or homophobic right like really and truly and also we're also complaining about the top one five percent jobs out there right we're not complaining about just getting your foot in the door and being a part of the industry and working as a seamstress or a you know a pattern cutter and stuff we're talking about being the creative director of these big houses where you're you're on like million dollar salaries or hundreds of thousands of pounds this is not some minor thing so it's a very small amount of people that get a job anyway do you know what i mean so i don't know if i agree with that sexist thing we agree or oh, sorry we continue here it says this is the very this is the very picture about the society we live in no space for women and diversity people again you know black men fails falls just underneath the woman when it comes to the hierarchy of diversity shame but it is what it is another one it's a white man's world still emphasis on men and white another one says is that mr ton okay another one says thank you for talking about this something many women in the industry have been feeling for a while now we've regressed there were many more female leaders 10 years ago yet they hire women with more experience than them to their right hand to do most of the work for the fraction of the pay and also maybe it's a support thing maybe there's a lack of support in terms of buying in terms of sales whatever it may be for certain women brands so that's why maybe some of the women designers out there don't get thrust into these big roles because they don't have the numbers to back it up maybe i don't know maybe that could be a thing i'm just throwing things out there and thinking on my feet another one says that last month the caring foundation hoopla about supporting women is just like the sustainability initiative is a, fa a facade of course it is, but it's always been sit there thinking these brands care about sustainability come on bro 
Let's be serious. Another one. Just sad. Diversity and inclusivity are a facade, a facade, sorry, and a PR big gimmick. Another one says zero surprises this. Um, we where I work in the last year, I heard a white gay guy referred to as a diversity hire. <laughs> I love fashion, man. Fashion is so fashion is the most fetishistic is that if that's a word industry in the world like they will prop you up if you happen to be a particular shade of black and look a particular way and really kind of use that to their advantage and you will use it to your advantage but when you hear it said sometimes it can sound so weird like it's like that it's like that famous tommy hill figure runway show where they had the models dress up in like you know fake afros and all this shit and i've heard beforehand that they were telling him in the back oh like blacking it up and stuff you know start doing all that nigga shit i don't know whatever they were telling him in the background some weird racial shit it, you know they basically told him to perform like monkeys or whatever it may be that's how weird the industry can get so just imagine you're in the fashion industry and someone says you're the fucking quote unquote exotic diversity hire because you're happen to be hispanic and gay <laughs> i love it oh it's so fucking horrible he says the bar is not even on the floor it's buried under the basement exactly oh my god a white gay man referred to as a diversity hire <laughs> is hilarious <laughs> this is so beautiful and let me tell y'all why there are countless black and asian brown and indigenous designers who could use all y'all support diversity equity and inclusion work is not about forcing companies to see the value of diversity through leadership um in fact is not about forcing okay in fact a company at its core must decide to value embrace and champion core values around deie i don't know what that means diversity oh diversity and inclusion um that being said there's clearly a lack of leadership diversity here and this gives us invaluable insight into what Alexander mcqueen and upper management really values you know what's funny though there was that rumor that was going around that Alexander McQueen, sorry, that Sarah Burton Alexander McQueen told um, Mawa Aloha that she wanted her to replace her at McQueen. And some people online actually thought that was going to happen. Bless, bless people's naivete, bless people's um, optimism to really think that they were going to hire <laughs> Mawa Aloha for that job. That would be obviously the best one to do. It would be fun. It's kind of forward thinking, right? It's, it's a bit of a risk right like there's probably a lot of um there's a lot there's probably a lot about her that kind of resonates with fucking mcqueen and it would go in a whole different uh, direction it would actually be a good hire but lol i think it did have the foresight to do something like that never happening um all that being said the comment says here to continue demand nothing from Alexander mcqueen and share your grievances it's our job and cons to as consumers to support the brands that actively embrace dei in fashion this goes beyond models makeup artists and hairdressers executive leadership and creative direction should also be highly diverse Let's stop begging in historically white institutions to include us and turn our attention to designers emerging who reflect us. We can't cling to oppressive systems while also trying to destroy and deconstruct them. We must, no matter how, how painful or chic, let it go. That's a, that's a good statement, to be fair. Support the ones that are actually doing the work, you know, but people aren't going to do that. They're going to, you know, the, people like the validation and, the, um, you know, whatever it may be from buying the brands that everybody knows, to be honest, unfortunately. Emerging diverse designers, di um, diverse our support, deserve our support sorry um a social media capital and our dollars let's divest from companies that continue to miss the mark and can tune into the fashion houses and designers who are getting it right whatever we put our attention towards mag uh, magnets uh, magnetizes let's magnetize those people and companies that are getting right good comment to be fair i see where it's coming from but again this is living in um, narnia that's not really going to happen i think by the time that new Alexander mcqueen collection drops and it's hard everyone's going to be sucking him off again and we'll forget all about this and that last one now it says so shocking and not surprising i'm pretty sure that if you look at the scholarships the awards the funding the press and the opportunities an industry full of women yet so overlooked it's not about the men not being talented or hard working it's just you need to be five times more to get a look in welcome to my world as a minority you don't get the opportunities that most people get you always have to be five times more sometimes 10 times more better than the next man to get any chance welcome to my life then let's not be surprised when women quit bashing their heads against a brick wall um it's the last one last one it says it's also a question of social impact from women their customers being clothed and dressed by men are we just being catered to um for the female gaze um, how about we look at fashion for the female body from the lens of a female lens from a female eye that's true that's true 
That's true as well. But hey, what can we do? It's a complex issue. I don't really know how to sort it. Obviously, the best way to go about it in the end will probably be to have a colorblind society where you just kind of give people jobs based on the character of them, based on their character and their talent. That's obviously not going to happen, but that will be the ideal place to get to because when you start going down the inclusion diversity list and way, it gets very murky very quickly and it can lead to some unfortunate circumstances. Case in point, the Tremaine Emery um, position at fucking Supreme. You know, it was kind of a diversity hire and it went disastrously wrong. And, you know, that's partly one of the, you know, um, faux pas of going down that route, to be honest. But hey, what do I know? Absolutely nothing. Moving on from that one, let's talk about Doja Cat. Doja Cat's on a mad one. And Doja Cat is doing the same thing that a lot of Kanye fans had to suffer through when Kanye decided to go down the Jesus route and then when Kanye decided he hated Jews. It's just one of the things that happens to most fans you have to kind of deal with in real time. And for me, I kind of have a lot of sympathy with Doja Cat because I can understand that it must be difficult being her and then realizing that you don't actually like the fans that you've cultivated over the years and maybe stardom came to you too quickly you went from being relatively unknown to being one of the biggest stars that exist out there there's a video currently at the moment from tom dark where he said allegedly um doja cat has more monthly listens on spotify than the weekend doesn't necessarily mean she's bigger than the weekend i still think the weekend can do an arena tour on his own that probably doja cat can never do but it still kind of shows the kind of the scale that she's kind of operating at and the stages that she's on that like she scale is huge but i can also understand at that level that maybe you lose touch with your audience you start to hate your stands they start to annoy you blah 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 so it feels like she's purposely going out of her way to annoy her fans to get them to all fuck off so she's left with a core group of people that she actually likes and that she can actually kind of be proud of or whatever it may be there's something in it of course or she just might be uh a little bit of an annoying trolley type of personality i think it's probably two things that can be right at the same time so the latest thing that she's done at the moment is post a picture on instagram where she's wearing a t-shirt that features sam hyde and if you know if you're on the internet you will know that sam hyde is a little bit of a troll right some people describe him as a neo-nazi but he's a little bit of a troll uh, mostly on the right side of things so people on social media definitely don't like him and he said some racy things online about race and gender and sexuality and blah 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 you know the 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 generic stuff that you these people say online and whatever it may be i know him from just the R I R L streams and whatnot and obviously some of the influencer boxing things and his ongoing beef with that guy who keeps ducking him i forgot his fucking name but who does a content cop thing so he's kind of well known in, in the kind of you know this the kind of scene streaming scene that i'm kind of a part of but obviously outside of that he's just probably seen as a fucking demon a devil right because people describe him as a neo-nazi so you can imagine what the fright that these guys had when they f discovered who he was by typing him in onto fucking google and reading some of the shit he gotten up to especially written by the mainstream media so he's going to paint him out to be a monster and they're like oh my god why is she wearing this t-shirt obviously doja is a bit of a pussy because she decided to take the picture down and then crop the t-shirt out and then post loads of emojis on there rolling her eyes and kind of trolling her fan base so she's clearly enjoying the fact that she constantly keeps poking and probing and upsetting her fans and this is probably off the back of a fairly lackluster album scarlet i didn't really you know it was kind of a bit of a letdown considering all the hype around it good elements i said before in my review it's it was not good but it still kind of displayed how much better she is than most girls if that makes sense it's a really thing, strange thing to say i know but even though it was crap it still showed that she's so much better than everybody else so even though crap stuff is better than everybody else which is a bit upsetting and probably a little bit um, demoralizing for the other girls coming up but my question is this how far does this go and does this actually hurt or influence her in the real world like will it come up will it come will there come a point where this will catch up to her and the trolling won't be fun anymore and she'll go back to being a you know a kind of underground quote-unquote artist because i think for the longest time she didn't want to be an underground artist there's videos of her online crying about wanting to be famous and wanting to make it she's been grinding for ages there's videos i played of her before freestyling like 10 years ago she's wanting to be famous for a long time so i'm sure if it ever was to get taken away from her she'd be gutted 
but it's clear to see that she also doesn't like the fan base that she has which is her prerogative right you sometimes i can imagine as an artist it can be weird when you really do blow up super crazy i think maybe kiss me is a was it kiss me with scissor whatever that track might have been the one that really got her going in a big way and it could just be a little bit you know overwhelming and maybe the fans that you then get and the expectation that you have just makes you feel uneasy and you want to just shake them off so maybe this is her attempt but how far do you go and can it really have some real life consequences of damages where it starts to kind of hamper her sales and her career because we've seen a little bit of it i feel like scarlet sales beast 50 to 70 grand first week considering the level of artist she is is pretty bad um maybe not the worst because it was without features and shit rarely hardly any promo i don't think she's in the interview for scarlet i don't think so she kind of kept herself to herself the tour is starting soon so that'll be good but maybe 50 to 70 grand is fine for first week but i think for the scale of art that she is she should be on 100k first week easy but maybe it's a reflection on her pissing off her fans i don't really know um but i'm interested to see how this plays out the only thing i'm curious to see about doja because i think this is a really interesting side of things is just how her identity thing i get the feeling that she's somebody that i don't know just doesn't identify a lot with the black race which is okay but i think in america there's definitely an issue with that because she people can't pigeonhole her you know what i mean it's hard to kind of put her in a box she kind of occupies rap hip-hop r&b pop world but she then also doesn't occupy certain boxes racially she looks a certain way but then she's clearly into a certain type of dude who's the kind of you know sam hyde incel looking dude which is basically now code for ugly and I've always wondered how that must be to be that outwardly because I've kind of grown up being the guy that was accused of only liking white girls when I was younger because of the stuff I was into, which is ironic because I haven't really dated many, right? Um, I've kind of gone out with every single race under the sun. Um, when I was super, super young growing up, I had a really hard time attracting black girls i tried my best when i was younger but they didn't like me because at the time i was one of the only people in my area that would skateboard that listened to like heavy metal music listened to punk music and shit i wore band t-shirts had like spiky wristbands and stuff and wore massive cargo pants and skate shoes and whatever maybe right so people would think of me a little bit weird so i wouldn't really tick the boxes of a conventional black dude especially at that time i understand but then obviously when i got to college i realized it wasn't what I was wearing and my vibe that actually turned me off to the black girls. It was just I had no game. I had no riz. I didn't realize at the time. I thought it was because of the way I was dressing. I was into skateboards. They don't give a fuck about that. The cute boy is a cute boy. It's just I had no riz. So I got some riz and then suddenly, you know, the, 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 the Nubian queen started to like man more. But then over time, because of my experiences and when I started going out in places, I just started to hook up and date with loads of people it didn't matter who they were right as long as i was into them because again I'm, I'm somebody that's not really based on race and stuff i'm mostly a personality person um as well like i mean as long as somebody's got a great vibe i can usually rock with it i'm not somebody that's kind of oh my gosh yes i did yes, I, that it's mostly just a vibe personality thing so that can open me up to a lot of people so i did get opened up to a lot of people no pun intended and i had my fun but whenever someone would ask me what you're into it's never been a race thing and it's always perplexed me when people are like oh i only like white girls i only like black people and it's just a strange thing because it almost sounds like you're fetishizing a race and you're also discounting an entire other races out there just because they don't happen to be the race that you particularly like it's just a strange thing and i think for me personally i would imagine the world love comes in different shapes sizes colors whatever and not allowing yourself to be open to that is strange and just only focusing on one particular group of people just limits it especially nowadays with the internet and social media why would you limit yourself to one kind of person when there's this whole group of people out there that you could potentially find who could be your mate um for long and long or someone to just have a good time with i never understood that but doja clearly is that kind of person who specifically likes a certain type of person and i'm wondering if that's had a part to play in her struggles or whatever's been going on. I don't know. Maybe it has, maybe it hasn't, but it's interesting to watch from the outside in because I've always been the opposite. I've always been trying to push away from this label that people will be putting me and be like, actually, my dating history and people I've been with is very, very broad, very diverse. Um, you know, it basically looks like the United Colors of Benetton advert. So I don't really, you know, abhor that kind of label just because I'm not a conventional, quote unquote, whatever that means, type of black person, which is also a bit of an insult, a little bit of a backhanded insult because, you know, there's no, you shouldn't, you know, there's no one um, prototype of what a black person is meant to look like. But it must be even weirder with Doja because she's mixed race, right? 
because she has a black half black half white thing going on so that's a whole different thing because there's always there's always a segment of help mixed race people that i've grown up with especially in my country in the uk where some of them maybe identify more with the white side because they grew up with a white parent and then they start to despise the black side because the the dad was absent and they have a lot of trouble with them and maybe whatever they get told certain things at home that makes them look at the black side with the bad eye whatever loads of things basically happen your race your how you raise the family the friends around you the circumstances to affect how you view certain people so i'm not judging anything but i'm just curious to see how this plays out for doja because it's a dangerous game it feels like it's a really dangerous game because at the end of the day her fans are the ones that put her on as much as she's the talent as much as she's the fucking star the fans also play their part there's only so much you can annoy your fans before as soon as you made it it's as soon as you can lose it and that'll be unfortunate because she's too talented to be out here you know being an underground artist like she deserves to be on the biggest platform but i'm also understanding and sympathetic of her struggle you know because you're a big star everything's scrutinized you can't just wear a fucking t-shirt do you know what i mean everyone's dissecting it and shit and turning it into a big topic like i am who would have funked it who would have funked it moving on we also got news here courtesy of Berghain regarding Berghain regarding the november 2023 lineup which i am absolutely happy about because it's very very underground it's very unknown there's not a lot of big names there it kind of feels a little bit localized it feels like it's one for the heads and if anything it gives me hope as an inspiring button dj that one day my name will end up in this gray font on this site one day in the future and when it does you guys will not hear the end of it i swear to god i might even get a tattooed on my body <laughs> when that happens i swear you watch just you wait so november 2023 lineup is out um very interesting lineups obviously as we scroll down the first one that pops out to me is of course november the fourth lineup here that features dj nobu I've always wanted to see DJ Nobu play and seeing him play in Bergheim would be amazing. Dasha Rush is also somebody that I'm a big fan of. Chris and Rosa Terenzi, who's meant to be playing here next week in Fold, or this weekend, sorry, in Fold. Um, Steffi, of course, who's an OG, and Yonti, who I've always been a fan of, who I'm sure, if I'm not mistaken, is the boyfriend of Roy Perez. So that should be interesting to see what type of stuff they play because I'd assume they play the same stuff, but I guess not because um, Roy Perez is more of a housey DJ who plays usually in Panama Bar, but Yonti's playing in Bergheim main room so that should be good and on the same night in Pano Bar you got Beige FKA M4A which I'm a big fan of Mary Moxamir who I absolutely love after seeing her uh, once or the first time sorry in Fabric and then subsequent times in other places Paramida Nix um, Ted Patterson I'm a big fan of and the Carry Nation the fourth is a good one big up Drift Kiev getting a night on the ninth and um, we've got a Rift Night happening we've got a Snacks event happening but one I'm really interested about which I make, make the effort to go to two times a month which is a bit excessive is the 11th of november which features arm playing in panorama bar and none other than dvs1 imagine that dvs1 is going to be playing in panorama bar that's fucking crazy he's usually a Berghain dj um he's known for sometimes having legendary Berghain sets there's still the hope that he will someday close Berghain. i've read on the Berghain subreddit that he doesn't want to close it because of some um issue with the mixer or something i don't really sure what's going on there but i would love to see him close Bergheim one time but i've seen him play at fold i've seen him play at e1 i've seen him play many places in london i haven't had a chance to see him play in fucking Bergheim just yet but for this particular event on the 11th of november he's going to be playing in panoba and i'm curious to see dvs playing house records because he never plays vocals right so i'm, I'm wondering in my head is he going to be playing like vocal like you know vocalless uh without vocals sorry fucking house music is that what he's going to be doing or is he going to be up there playing fucking um no way back you know what i mean like what's going to be going on there i don't know i'm really curious to see what dvs does so i'm really curious and i might actually go just because of that and obviously on that same lineup you got arm playing there i also want to see dixon it's been a while since dixon's playing Berghain. he had one of the legendary sets actually there back in the day one of the reasons why i actually went to fucking um uh, Bergheim in the first place it was I think it was like a Bergheim in rent review let me see if I can actually get it up it was an event review from a really long time ago let's see if I can find it here I think it was RA Bergheim event let's see event review and let's write Dixon let's see if we can find it because I remember Dixon played there and yeah there we go it's 2000 and see there we go 2017 actually 
it was 2017 as you can see here from the link this is from news from back in the day so in 2017 dixon played an all-night set at berkheim and the school so um the Indivision boss revealed on berlin amsterdam locations that today's part of the ongoing all-night long tour so he played on the finest berkheim on that day there let's see if we can find any reviews of the actual event i'm not really sure if we can but let's go on the listings here Kershaw Berghain itself so he played all night long in Berghain in 2017 on the Friday I mean well yeah wow that's incredible so he said the panel bar he played actually in Berghain that's actually interesting um and obviously you see the list there of him playing at Contact Tokyo Berghain the school Amsterdam and Robert Johnson in Frankfurt off and back that's fucking cool isn't it that's a really cool lineup of places to play Tokyo Berlin Amsterdam and um, Germany right japan germany netherlands germany again absolutely barnstorming i'm not sure if we got the the uh event review but i do remember back in the day there was an event review for it that i remember reading and it legitimately made me want to go bergheim that was how good it was because it kind of spoke about how amazing dixon's set was how it went let me see if i can actually find it on here i don't think i actually will event review dixon let's see if i can find it on here the, 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 I don't think it is on here actually unfortunately let's see 2017 it's right there on the google let's see if anything comes up da, 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 da. nope actually not there's nothing here that shows you the event review itself unfortunately but i do remember it happened so you know i'm good just stick with me so i'd like to see him play there soon um but we've seen arm playing at berghain a lot so big up arm for being able to play there um we've also got danielle dinky um hiroku yamamura playing there marcel deepman and, and balkheimer one of my favorites as well but one i'm really curious to go to as we scroll down is this line up towards the end of the month which is aurora aurora halal answer code request iron x tracks marina Philippa pacho quelza who allegedly is going to be closing quelza is fucking one of my favorites one of my um new discoveries i've been obsessed with um very um interesting dj because i feel like he provides soundtracks as opposed to just mixes it almost feels like he's scoring your night as opposed to just whacking out tunes it's really interesting to kind of speak about and he's also very thematic he kind of plays a lot of records that ties into where he's playing at he kind of matches the mood the atmosphere of where he's at like he's just a really good dj overall and obviously in the following friday the, the, the friday before partok and roy perez are playing in panel bar that should be sick you got ryan Eller, so playing on that that same day stefan goldman panel bar you got um aki sorry akira hawks avalon emerson who'll be interested to see um boy shorts jesse lanza mala aika and mike star who i absolutely love in terms of straight up sick house dj so if anything very headsy lineup not a lot of big blockbuster names but definitely one for the heads and i'm really eager to go so november's looking fucking sick the fourth obviously like i said um with nobu is absolutely great um dvs1 playing in fucking panel bar is going to be a mad one i'm curious to see what the reviews will be there for that i'm actually trying to do that thing that i've always wanted to do um before that where i might do one of those things where i fly out on saturday and come back on monday and just check out just that one party and not actually you know maybe take stay one night in one place and kind of stay out the whole entire time that i'm there it's a bit of a mad one but i might have to try it because if i'm not mistaken the station next to Bergheim has lockers that people can use to leave stuff in and shit so i can essentially get somewhere you know have that there have my little toothbrush and shit go and have a good time sleep and then come back home i might have to try to just to see if it's one of panel but it's worth it and of course in the main room there's rod had tasha and jacko jacko playing also so it's not the it's not like a shit night do you know what i mean it's gonna be fucking sick so i'm curious to see how that goes i'm really really curious to see how that goes so if you're interested check it out um berghain november lineup where you find most of the berghain lineups don't delay do not flipping delay moving on we have a really interesting 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 news here Kershaw Berlin stuff so Kershaw RA it says new club and creative space is set to open at Berlin Tegel airport and um, this is the airport that I used to go to actually when I was go when I was first going to Berlin and unfortunately now it's shut down and now we all have to go to fucking Brandenburg airport which is fucking annoying um there used to be two but this you know there's only one now but um, it says here it's now being turned into an event space I think it makes sense because throughout the pandemic they filmed quite a few um parties in there and live streams i think i forgot the channel on youtube that does it i think it was like 
United Streams or something like that or whatever it was called and they were really cool and the space is fucking amazing it's a fucking airport so you just imagine the kind of stuff they can do there it's sort of secluded and out of the way also so you'd imagine they could probably you know get away with more when it comes to noise pollution so there's a lot of interesting things they could do with this space and turn it into an amazing cultural center whatever maybe there's loads of options to go there instead of just bulldozing and get them turning it into fucking co-working spaces let's actually make it for something that creatives can use make it top tie in with the local community get back to the arts have a platform there for people to do interesting things like there's cool stuff to do let's not turn it into another dumb co-working place full of we works and glass buildings with metal fucking for cards and horrible shitty coffee shops with overpriced coffee and shitty fucking avocado toastings let's make it interesting please for the love of god and this is looking so far so good turbulence txl launches with a free day party on saturday which is just gone right the saturday just gone oh no it's actually last saturday actually so i'm actually late it says new cultural venues opening up and now shut at teagle airport launching this saturday september 3rd turbulence txl will take over what was once the canteen area of the airport as well as dj sets the space will host live music workshops art installations and among other things sounds sick while saturday's party is free to attend capacity is capped at 700 that's a big space bro um marina philippa philippa jammer Philippo Hohan Tim or Johan Tim, Lizbird and Sarab are among the performers. Zebra Cats, oh, Zebra Cats, I've not seen in a while. That's an OG name. And R. Ruston, who's fucking a so such a good dj i seen a player fold also like oh so good it's very very underrated we also got back to back find out more via the events listing below tigo airport closes november 2020 the following year the space hosted the art festival um whatever that one is called here are some more photos of it looks fucking incredible that's actually what it reminds me of weirdly enough it kind of reminds me of like pictures that thinking what's his face and um, wolfgang tilms would, would have taken like it kind of gives me that sort of vibe that that berlin from ages ago so it's great to see let's actually see if there's actually any more events happening at this turbulence because this looks fucking great i'd love if we had the same thing here in london but most likely if they knock down an airport they'd fucking turn it into a fucking warehouse you know for you know cheap clothing or something it definitely wouldn't be allowed to be turned into a cultural center or for nightlife or anything but let's see what other events happen there they had the opening part let's see if they have anything else um so far we got nothing no overview on anything else let's go on the website which is probably their instagram i'm assuming let's see if they've got anything else on there we click their instagram or their website let's see if they've got more events because i want to see if there's anything else going on something happened on the third great to see a few location on google maps there's obviously more pictures here of the site which look fucking great get in there public transport car okay accessibilities cool 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 our values about us great to see great bunch of diversity there with the team we love to see it instagram let's see what they've got here i want to see what it look oh look how good that looks already let's check out the instagram this looks fucking interesting an airport that's been converted into a cultural center and the rave location i'm all for it look how cool that looks we can't believe what this person say here we can't believe it's already been a week since the first dance big thanks to everyone that came also thanks to the patience of the things to still work out our journey is long if you miss the opening you'll get another chance next saturday aurora is inviting sublime and layers for our first proper techno rave okay cool oh wow okay i'm eager to see what that looks like actually let's see if we can check the location and see if anybody's uploaded any pictures of the ha party that happened on saturday because i could probably see it on my phone but most likely i want to see if we can check it up on the screen here as i'm actually recording the pod because that's actually the much more interesting way to check out these things right that's actually more interesting things you scroll down here you see a top post let's see the most recent ones if we got it there we go we've got the most recent post here we've got people posing outside the liftoff oh this guy as well he's all he's he's fuck he's a famous raver boy he's always at burger and i always see this dude here at burger so if he's there it's probably a good sign that it was a good rave let's actually go to his flipping um profile and see if he's got anything here lifestyle techno guy let's actually go to some other images we got the last our techno we got some of the speakers there we got the vision of it let's see um if he's got anything he uploaded on his own profile in terms of stories of what may have happened over the weekend he's probably at Burkhan, i'm assuming my guy lifestyle.techno let's see if he's got anything else on there let's click on his stories and see what he's been up to out there in berlin what's he been up to oh mostly mostly Berghain, obviously wearing his underground resistance t-shirt also so it's all good it's all good but i am curious to see what this flipping turbines txl looks like when i'm actually there 
um, in a couple of weeks. Um, I'm definitely going to check it out. I'll probably be there at the end of November. Obviously, again, at the start of November as well. I think I'll probably hit them both times and check it out and see what the vibe is saying. But it does look really, really cool. I'm not going to lie. They also got an artist call out, I guess, to maybe spray paint some walls or shit. I would assume people posting some stuff here and there. Not a lot of things but it's getting there it's getting there i guess the people have got to go there first and then we're going to see it pop get populated with posts and whatnot and let's actually go back to turbulence's um um post and see if they've got anything else uploaded from this past saturday let's go to the main page and see what the deal was here before we finish this blood cart pot nope nothing else has been lifted there so not not much lift off just yet but it's getting there okay not much lift off just yet but it's getting there so big up them great to see it i can't wait to see what else they do going forward i can't wait to see what else they do going forward anyways that has been the excellent zing show episode number 714 thank you for tuning in if it's your first time checking out the show you know what to do give me some love all that good stuff would be much appreciated links all my social medias and whatever else can be found in the description and also the name of the tune of the day which should be playing underneath my voice as i am exiting to this if you listen via the audio pod if you're just watching it via the video stream Thank you for tuning in. Of course, make sure you like like it and whatever it may be and leave me a comment if you have any questions and I'll see you guys again very, very soon. Thank you for tuning in to the Exodus Zinger Show. Peace out, my friends. Have a good one. Thank you for tuning in. Bye.